And uh, as usual, if, um, if you want a copy of the slides, uh, uh, you can just email me. My contact info will be there at the end. Um, and uh, also another note about references. Uh, I'm going to be citing a few different studies um, that if you want to, uh, uh, to get full text articles of, um, they're available through either the library or through Google Scholar. Um, I was able to track them down, no problem, and download them and everything. So uh, uh, at the end, there's also going to be a slide with the full reference list. Um, and you can also email me uh, to get that as well if you want. Um, so with that, uh, we can get started. Um, as, uh, uh, as the title slide mentions, um, this presentation is all about uh, clinical significance versus uh, what's traditionally known as statistical significance. And with statistical significance, you get uh, these p-values, which is always that sort of magic number we're looking for. Um, but clinical significance is another side of the coin that is uh, often overlooked in research. And so uh, this presentation is designed to cover those issues uh, and go over some uh, nitty gritty details. Not too many though. Um, so what I wanna go over first of all are some definitions of clinical significance um, and then uh, compare group designs um, with the individual level of analysis. So with uh, significance testing, um, specifically what's called null hypothesis significance testing, um, you typically are looking at a group and not at individuals. And you're only concerned about uh, the overall patterns in the group and not what individuals are doing within that group. So um, within that discussion, there's this issue of effect sizes. Um, and that's also another corollary to significance testing. Um, and this actually, uh, th this topic provides segue into clinical significance because it's all about how big of a difference is uh, uh, taking place. And that is what effect sizes are all about at the group level. And at the individual level, that's where you have clinical significance. It's kind of like an effect size, except for an individual in instead for a group instead of a group. Um, okay, so at the individual level, we're more concerned about therapeutic goals. How is this one individual doing compared to everybody else, not how is this group doing compared to this other group? For scientific purposes, for research purposes, you're often concerned about the overall efficacy of a treatment, things of that sort, but for uh, individuals, we're more concerned about their therapeutic outcomes. Um, and so it's really more about comparing an individual to some reference group, and we'll talk about what that reference group might be. There are all kinds of options that are uh, possible depending on your goals and the client's goals, of course. Um, and I'll, I'll use client and uh, patient interchangeably. Um, so if, if I kind of use one or the other, then um, you know just bear with me. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, you can feel free to uh, type them into the, um, the chat box. And I forgot to mention my colleague, Dr. Adu, who some of you know, I believe, um, will be uh, fielding the questions um, as we go through. So don't, don't hesitate to ask if there's uh, anything that you, wanna, uh, you want me to go into more detail about. Okay, so um, once we get into uh, the sort of individual level versus the, uh, uh, the group level, that's where clinical significance really comes into play. And then um, there are different ways to measure clinically significant change. There are both quantitative and qualitative criteria that we could use. And so I'll talk about uh, uh, both of those as well. Um, specifically, you can use different scales, uh, like the Beck Depression Inventory is a really good example. Um, and uh, there are other metrics like quality of life, which are a bit more subjective, but they are sometimes much more valuable than uh, what, uh, what a scale, uh, what a number can tell you about a person and how they're doing. Um, and uh, finally, I wanna just you know, touch upon uh, this one item here at the bottom about how it can be difficult to assess uh, how people are, how clients are uh, changing over time uh, when you have severe cases or conditions that uh, preclude um, a valid analysis. Um, okay, so 
with that, uh, let's let's get into it. So definitions. Um, there are there are two main kinds of definitions. Uh, one is returning to normal functioning. So when you see that someone is at the beginning of treatment, uh, just really either you know depressed or anxious or has some uh, uh, really let's just say debilitating uh, problem or condition, um, what you're hoping for is that after treatment they will return to uh, the range within which we could call uh, normal functioning. Um, sometimes it's called typical functioning. Uh, there are different different terms, but basically the idea is that there's a, a, a sort of range within which we can say that someone is normally functioning, and that's uh, the, the definition of a clinically significant improvement is that you're no longer within the range of, uh, you know, being severely depressed or anxious or what have you, but you're uh, uh, back in the um, range of being quote unquote normal. And then another definition uh, refers to the practical value or importance of the effect of an intervention. So uh, whether it makes any real difference to the client or to others with whom they interact in everyday life. So this first definition is really more about normative ranges on say the Beck Depression Inventory or the BDI. Um, and so you can test someone pre and post treatment and say, okay, well, before we started, they were definitely you know, on the lower end of the distribution for uh, what we could call depressed uh, clients. And then after um, treatment, we can see that they're right at the mean of the, uh, the normative uh, uh, range. So the other definition is not so much about, um, you know, quantifying someone's clinically significant improvement, but more about this, this idea of practical value or importance, which is much more subjective. And um, this is where you get more qualitative interpretations of clinical significance where, you know, what's the, what, what's the real difference to the life of uh, the client or the people close to them? Um, and that can only be gauged by uh, asking. You know, you can't you can't have a number tell you uh, what the the client is experiencing. So both of these are going to be important, and uh, and we have to keep that in mind as we go through the entire presentation. And and at the end, I'll tie this all back together with how we actually measure these things. Uh, so far, so good. Um, just going to do a quick check. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk about sort of traditional research um, and statistical significance. So uh, basically, this is where group designs come into play, where we're looking at uh, what we'll just call group one, which is a, a specific or a particular condition that a researcher might be interested in um, uh, assessing and determining whether an experimental treatment might be uh, somehow beneficial. Um, and the other group, what I'm calling group two here, would be this normal functioning comparison group. Sometimes it's called a control group. Uh, if you're collecting data on uh, uh, a group that you know you can check for you know history of depression and um, familial history of any kind of psychiatric uh, conditions and things of this sort, and you know you exclude people if they do have them, and if they don't, then you can put them in the control group and uh, assess their uh, uh, let's just say Beck depression inventory scores. Um, the other option, sorry, I'm doing these out of order, but the other option is that you uh, you can use previously published data. This is where normative data, that's, that's the sort of definition of normative data, is that there are these massive studies using thousands of participants where they collect scores for, um, you know, important populations. So you could have a study that uh, sampled, you know, 18 to 35 year olds, uh, males and females, uh, you know, of all different ethnicities, all different socioeconomic statuses, and they provide tables in which you get, you know, the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, all the different scores that you could expect within that uh, population. And then you can compare your group data that you're collecting data on to these normative data. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, another type of group, right? It's just that it's not a group that you're collecting data from as you would in this second option. Um, 
And so basically what you would do is uh, you would look at pre and post treatment scores of group one compared to nor the normative data or the, the control group and see, okay, well, from before to after treatment, group one is improving. Um, and whereas before, uh, you know, they, they were, um, let's just say, significantly lower, statistically significantly lower in terms of, uh, I, I guess, higher in terms of depression, they had higher depression. Then after the intervention, uh, they might be either closer to the normative group or farther from their own pretreatment scores. There are different types of analyses that you could run to, uh, to look at it this way or that way. Um, but the general idea is that, um, that there's this really low probability, right? The probability is less than 5%. That's what 0.05 is. The probability is less than 5% that the post-treatment sample represents the same population as the pretreatment sample. So what that means is that the difference from pretreatment to post-treatment is uh, very unlikely to just have happened due to chance. So there's got to be some reason why it's different. And well, most likely it's that they went through this treatment, right? So um, that's where we get this P is less than 0.05 idea is that the, the group from before treatment to after treatment has changed in such a way that we can no longer say with any degree of certainty that uh, they're the same. And so they're different. And so why could that be? Well, they went through the treatment. So what else could it be? If you designed a good study, there shouldn't be anything else that's different about them. But what happens with group designs is that, again, you're, you're uh, looking at the group overall. You're looking at the distribution of scores and uh, you're not really focused on the individual. You're just focused on whether or not overall the treatment had this uh, effect on the, on the overall sample. And then you make inferences about um, what that means for people in general. So um, that's, that's kind of going to be juxtaposed later against individual level. Uh, so, so keep in mind this kind of notion. Um, and I'm just reviewing it in order to uh, you know, make sure that it's uh, front and center for now. So uh, along with um, p-values, we also get effect sizes. And what effect sizes tell us is in addition to whether there's a significant difference, how big is that difference? You can have a, a statistically significant difference between two groups and have that difference be just tiny, just tiny. Um, the example I like to use is the, a, a study that Facebook did where um, they uh, uh, manipulated the information that people got in their feeds. And basically, uh, some people were exposed to um, a slightly higher percentage of like negative words. So they would literally tell the algorithm to uh, filter out more positive words and leave negative words in people's feeds. And then uh, they would see the amount of negative words that those people then produced in their own posts and comments and things like that, and compared it to people who uh, didn't have that manipulation. And they found that there's a statistically significantly higher amount of negative uh, uh, content that people post and uh, uh, leave in their own comments if they're exposed to this you know, negative content themselves. But the difference was like 0.5%. And it's like half a percent more words out of 100 percent. That is a minuscule effect. And it doesn't really mean that, you know, somehow they've been caused to be depressed or, or, or have caused to be uh, put in a bad mood. It's, it's what you would call uh, a clinically insignificant effect, a very small effect size. But nevertheless, it's statistically significant. So it made headlines uh, a few years ago and, um, you know, people were all up in arms. But it turns out that. Uh, um, you know, the, the effect is really small. Nevertheless, it's unethical. Uh, Facebook got slammed for being unethical about that. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, okay, so, so the effect size tells us in terms of standardized units, uh, the, the number of standard deviations, that's what a standardized unit is, is the number of standard deviations that a group mean shifts. So um, I'll get into what that means in a minute, but uh, basically what we can do is we can compare um, the group to itself at an earlier time, like before they went through treatment compared to after they went through treatment, um, or compared to a reference group, right? So we can say, okay, well, compared to the normative data uh, that's previously published 
or compared to the control group that we just collected data from, how is the, uh, the experimental group faring? And we, we can say how far apart they are in terms of the, let's just say the Beck scores. Um, so to kind of put this in uh, uh, visual terms, and, and uh, I promise this is, this is as complex as the math gets here, um, unless we have time. If we have time, um, we'll walk through an example of something else, but we'll see if we get to that. Um, but the, the most common effect size that you'll see is Cohen's D. Um, and what we're looking at is, uh, th here's a distribution of uh, depression level by the Beck de depression inventory score. So there was a study that was done, and uh, you can see that there are uh, about 30 participants that have scores between 15 and 20. Um, that's what the, the sort of highest frequency is. There are maybe two or three people who had scores between 55 and 60. There were about seven people who had scores between zero and five. So you see that you've got basically this nice normal curve that you can superimpose over it, and that's our distribution of, of scores, right? In terms of the BDI, scores. But when we're talking about effect sizes, we have to standardize it. That's why we have these denominators of SD, and SD stands for standard deviation. So what the heck does that mean? Well, basically what we're looking at is th there's always a, a numerator and a denominator, right? So in both of these cases, um, we've got a, a score, which is an X bar, means the, the mean for the group uh, of the post-treatment score minus the mean from the pretreatment score. So the mean of this group is somewhere in here, right? Let's just, let me just mark this up a little bit here. Uh, the, let's just say that the mean of this group is right here at about 25, okay? So, uh, so that's our, uh, let's just say that's our, our pre-mean is 25, right? And uh, basically after the, uh, the intervention, maybe the distribution shifts to be Let's say, oh wait, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't want them to increase in terms of depression. That's not a very good example. Um, what we want is for them to uh, to have lower scores, right? So perhaps what happens is that the distribution shifts to look more like this, right? And then the mean is let's just say 10, right? So the 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 post treatment mean is 10, and so you know that means that they went. Uh, the, the overall change was negative 15, right? But we have to put that in terms of these standardized units. So we divide by the uh, standard deviation, and that's what standardizes this. So what I mean by that is, essentially, um, when you look at the data in terms of standard deviations, you see now there's this, uh, there's this scale over here, which is the same information except in terms of standard deviations. So at zero, that's where our mean is right? Zero standard deviations away from the mean is where that magic number was, that mean of 25. But then now you see that in the post condition, so right, there's there's 25, it's at zero, but then after the intervention, it's at about mm, one and a half standard deviations away from the mean, right? So guess what? We divide by 1.5. Um, or no, I'm sorry, no, no, that's... Uh, that's the actual effect size. It, it moved one and a half standard deviations. What the standard deviation of the uh, the actual um, group was initially is you can see that from zero standard deviations. Let me erase all this so that it's not uh, that it's not in our way here. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the standard deviations, what we've got is a uh, a difference from zero to one standard deviations, right? And from zero to negative one, it's the same thing. Uh, we have a shift of 10 points, right? You see that you're going from 25 to 35 and from 25 to 15. And it's the same from negative one standard deviations to negative two, you're also moving over by 10 points and so on. So uh, the standard deviation uh, of, the, uh, of the group isn't 1.5. Sorry about that. Uh, it's 10. That's our standard deviation. So negative 15 divided by 10. Um, and so the, our effect size, negative 15 by 10 is what 1.5. So that's reflected in this shift, right? You went from a mean of 25 to 10, and that's a shift of one and a half standard deviations. And that's our Cohen's D. So uh, that's how you would calculate that. 
And basically, um, this tells you the magnitude of the effect. So whenever you see a number like this, you can say, okay, well, that's a pretty large effect because typically what happens with any intervention is that you'll see an effect size of like 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Anything above 0 0.8 is considered large. And so here, this is like a massive effect, right? Um, and basically, uh, this tells you not only that there was a significant change in terms of the pre to post distributions, you can also quantify the extent of that change. Because you could just as easily have, you know, a distribution that looks like, like this, and that's a bigger effect, right? Because now you've moved even farther along. The p-value just tells you, okay, yeah, that's still a significant difference. Um, and certainly, you could always have a, a much smaller effect and still have that be significant. And that's where it gets more interesting because, you know, if you have a significant effect, but, you know, the distribution looks like, uh, let's say, like this, well, what's going on there? If that's a significant effect, is it clinically significant? And one way to start to get at that idea is with effect sizes. And if you have a very small effect size, it's like, well, you know, if the group only really moved 0.1 standard deviations, is that really clinically significant, even if it's statistically significant? And some would argue no. But without having this number, you wouldn't be able to really say that with any certainty. So, um, that's, the, that's the, the sort of first step towards getting at clinical significance. I want to pause here and see if there are any questions. All right. Well, you guys, I'm, I'm doing either an excellent job or your eyes are rolling in the back of your head. Either way, uh, I guess I got to keep going. Um, and then the, the that's the within groups um, uh, version of this. For the between groups, the, the denominator is a little bit more complicated. Uh, I don't want to get into that, um, but there is uh, uh, you know, a formula that I can get you if you want. Um, just email me and, and we can uh, communicate about that. But um, anyway, it's very similar. Just uh, a different adjustment needs to be made to uh, account for the fact that there are two groups um, instead of just one. Okay, so uh, that was group um, analysis, right? That's where statistical significance comes into play. That's where effect sizes comes into play. But uh, there's a risk that we're not seeing the individuals. We might be losing the trees for the forest. Yes, that's backwards from the actual saying of, you know, don't miss the forest for the trees. We also don't want to miss the trees for the forest. Um, and the idea is that in a group level analysis, uh, you know, you're looking at overall change, and that's the scientific goal, right? Is there overall effectiveness of an intervention? Um, but again, it ignores individual changes. Some will improve, others don't change, some decline. And at the group level, e even if some people decline and some people don't change, if there's enough improvements so for some people, you'll see that the overall mean is moving, the overall group mean, the, dis the distribution is moving, uh, you know, higher or lower in terms of the scores that you're collecting. Um, but from a clinical perspective, um, we are interested in each one of those individuals. So uh, that's where the individual level comes into play. That's where we get uh, interested in, um, improved outcomes for the clients and patients and individual clients and patients. So uh, there are also ways to quantify and describe individual data points. Um, again, some improve, some don't change, and some decline. But with that group type of analysis, you really miss those trees for the overall forest. And um, this is where we start to really get uh, into how individuals change. Okay, so uh, there are some quantitative criteria for this kind of clinical significance, and uh, there's, there's two ways to look at it. So, by the way, first of all, before we even get into the details of this, I'm, I'm talking about quantitative criteria. Uh, afterwards, we'll talk about qualitative criteria. Okay, so just 
big picture for now. That's the forest. Let's look at the trees. Um, the quantitative criteria come in two forms. Um, one is uh, an individual's post-therapy change toward those normative levels of functioning that I talked about. Um, the other one is uh, a high percentage of clients improving or recovering. So you can quantify, okay, how many, um, you know, for each individual, you can say whether they deteriorated, whether they were unchanged, whether they improved, or whether they recovered. This is kind of a scale, right? Deteriorated means they got worse. Unchanged means they stayed the same. Improved means they got better. And recovered means that, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, um, they are back within the, the normal range. Or normative range. Sorry, I, I don't I don't like that word normal and abnormal. It's a little ableist, if you will. But anyway, um, so uh, we can look at it in terms of how each individual is doing, and then also uh, what percentages fall into each one of these categories. So you can say, for example, okay, if 90% recovered, 10% improved, and there were no unchanged and no deteriorated, that's a much better outcome than if you know 30% deteriorated. 60% were unchanged, and then 10% improved, and no one recovered. Uh, that is a very nice corollary to uh, describing the effectiveness and, of course, the clinical significance of a treatment. Um, and with statistically significant findings, you wouldn't see any of that. So, uh, of course, these are very good uh, pieces of information to include in a dissertation. Um, look for it in publications if you're doing your own research, certainly. Uh, these are really good items to include. Okay, so uh, let's look at that first item, normative levels of functioning post-therapy. Um, there is a uh, uh, reliable change index, RCI, and uh, Jacobson and, uh, and that group um, are the, the real sort of proponents of that. This research has been cited hundreds, if not thousands of times. Um, in, uh, in, in therapy research, it's the most widely used change index uh, regarding clinical significance. Um, and so, again, like I mentioned, these references, uh, there's a slide at the end that um, we'll get to uh, so that you can track these publications down. Um, and I'm just going to go over what basically they say. Uh, and what they say is, well, there are three possible criteria to determine clinically significant outcomes. Um, and these three criteria fall into two categories. The first category is if there are normative data, I'm sorry, if there are no normative data available for a lot of different uh, conditions, you know, orphan disorders, uh, what have you, um, there are no normative data because they're rare conditions. So there, have, there hasn't been an opportunity to collect normative data yet. Um, and in some cases, such as depression, uh, there are normative data available. And depending on which the case is for your particular study, um, you have different criteria that you would use to determine that clinical significance. So if there are no normative data, um, your criterion would be that your participant is two standard deviations above or below the pretreatment mean. Uh, let's unpack that a little bit. So standard deviations, we kind of went over that a little bit earlier, right? So uh, if we go back to um, this slide here, right, we know that there are standard deviations, and the farther away from the mean you go, the lower, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the higher or the lower your score is in either direction. Um, let's see. And uh, the other piece is above or below. Well, why is it above or below? The idea is that uh, for some conditions, the normative group has higher scores than uh, the, uh, the treatment group. And in other cases, it's the opposite. So for example, in, uh, in depression, in the, in the BDI, uh, oh gosh, I forget, I, I, I'm blanking. I think you want lower depression scores? Oh gosh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, in, in some other uh, scales, maybe you want higher scores, right? So whichever direction you want to go, you know, the idea is that you want to be moving towards the normative data. Um, and that could mean that you're going above or below the, uh, the pretreatment mean in that, um, that treatment group. 
Now, that's one option, right? If there are no normative data. If there are normative data, you have uh, a couple of other options. One is that uh, your post-treatment score, and these are all individual scores. What I'm talking about is one individual, right? That their score is two standard deviations above or below the mean. Um, or uh, that individual, if there are normative data, you want them to be within the range of the normative distribution. And when I say within the range, I really mean within two standard deviations of that normative distribution. And I'll show you that graphically in a minute. Um, another option, and uh, this one is also a good one. Uh, certainly there are pros and cons to each of these two, but uh, we don't really have time to get into that. Uh, is the post-treatment score being closer to the normative distribution than to the pre-treatment uh, distribution? So basically you find the halfway point, and if that person is closer to the normative mean, then to the pretreatment mean, then you can say that it's been a clinically significant change. So graphically, here's what that means. So we've got our treatment group here, right? This is our treatment group. That's the distribution of scores. Uh, and this is our normative group, right? Um, we, can, we can see that for the normative group. A bunch of people already did the heavy lifting for the normative data, and the mean of that group is 60. Um, the mean of our treatment group from our study is 40. And we've got a person who scored, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, what we have are um, three different points that we would treat as cutoff values for clinical significance. And uh, again, the first one is point A, which you see here. Uh, point A is two standard deviations above the, uh, the pretreatment mean. So here's our treatment group. Uh, the mean is 40, right? And uh, this isn't quantified here, but uh, you can trust that this point A, this is where uh, we are at plus two uh, standard deviations above this mean of 40, right? So from 40 up to here, it looks like about 55 or so, um, that's where that cutoff is. So if this normative group doesn't exist and all you have is a treatment group, and the person scores a 55 after treatment, you say, okay, bingo, this person has had uh, a clinically significant improvement. Um, now, if the normative data are available, uh, then we compare that person not just to the treatment group, but the normative group as well. So if they are within if they are at point B or higher, right? So anywhere in here, then we can say that they've had a, a clinically significant improvement. What you'll notice is that this point B is much less stringent, right? Because this is a score of about 45, whereas if there were no normative data, you'd have to have a 55. So that is kind of a check against false positives, as they're called. So if you don't have any normative data, you have to be pretty darn sure that there's been a big improvement before you can conclude that, was a, that there was a clinically significant uh, change. But if there are normative data, then you know that you know, there are enough people who have scores of, well, let's just say 45 or more, uh, to know that that's already within that normative range, right? Obviously, it would be better if they score higher, but still, um, that's, that's what's established as a, as a standard. And so um, that's this criterion B. Now, criterion C, uh, the post-treatment score has to be closer to normative distribution than the pretreatment distribution. That's, that's this point C here. And it's literally halfway between the mean of the treatment group and the mean of the normative group. And that's, that's where this 50 comes into play. Um, so that uh, what we end up with is this kind of middle of the road criterion, right? Where B is maybe a little too liberal, A is really stringent, and C is kind of just right. But again, C is only available if you have the normative data. Um, and so that is what we have as the standards that as they currently exist. Back in the 90s, people were arguing back and forth, back and forth, like, what do we set up? What do we use? And you know, individual studies had basically their own criteria that they used, and um, over time, it's developed to the point where these are the the kind of uh, standards that we're um, that we're using. Uh, so, 
in order to calculate these points, um, there are a couple of publications that uh, are pretty good at providing examples of how this works. Uh, and if we have time towards the end, like I said, we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll go through an example. Um, but if not, then these are really good uh, and, and it's all relatively straightforward. Um, it's just basically like uh, arithmetic, more or less. Um, you just have to have the values uh, plugged in from you know, normative groups um, and your treatment group. So the hard part is collecting the data <laughs> and then the, the calculation is uh, relatively straightforward. Um, okay, so uh, from here, um, the question is, you know, how do we get into these different levels of, uh, of clinical significance, right? Remember I mentioned that there are these possible outcomes, right? Deteriorated, unchanged, improved, or recovered. Uh, so all of these criteria talk about um, different sort of levels of that scale. So what we have is um, two dimensions that we have to look at. Uh, is the client, after treatment, are they outside the pre-treatment range, yes or no? Uh, and also, is that same client within the normative range, yes or no? Because you could be somewhere in between. Uh, for example, if you're, if you're not outside the pre-treatment range and you're not within the normative range, you're either unchanged or you've deteriorated, right? Because you're still within the pretreatment range, but you're nowhere near the normative range. So you're either just kind of had no effect or you've gotten worse, but you're still within the pretreatment range, right? Um, but it's possible that you did move outside the pretreatment range, but not into the normative range. So there you've only improved, you've not recovered. That's the criteria that are established. Um, for saying whether someone's improved versus unchanged and improved versus recovered, right? Because if you're outside the pretreatment range and you're within that normative range, then you're said to have recovered. And that's where points uh, B and C come into play, right? Because depending on how you um, dictate uh, where you're comfortable, so to speak, depending on which researcher you ask, some will say, oh, I'm gonna use B, other ones will say, well, I'm gonna use C as that, as that cutoff for uh, what constitutes the normative range. Because certainly there are people in the normative group who are all the way out here, right? All the way towards the bottom of the distribution. Well, guess what? Maybe they actually have a problem. Um, they just aren't diagnosed or they haven't sought help. So, um, you know, there, there's always a little bit of justification you have to do for why you're going to choose point B or point C. And um, depending on which one you use, then you say, well, okay, I'm using point B to determine whether or not someone is within normative range. Someone else might say, well, I'm using point C. And then you look at the number that you get for that participant and you say whether they've improved, recovered, or are unchanged or deteriorated. Now, um, if some th this this cell here is a little you know of a of a of a difficult concept. Um, if you're outside the pretreatment range, right? So you've at least uh, you know no, I'm sorry. If you're still inside the the pretreatment range, so you haven't you haven't uh, recovered, right? Um, but you're within the normative range. This is kind of what I was alluding to just now. Um, you don't know the clinical significance because <clears throat> that's that's where you're kind of in this shaded area, right? Or or below you're you're below C or below B. And here it's like, well, what's going on? We could call you either part of the normative group or part of the treatment group, and we don't really know what the clinical significance is. So that one that one is you know a little bit of a of a gray area. Um, but in any case. Um, these are the sort of uh, four options that we have, and this is how you would classify someone as unchanged or deteriorated or improved or recovered or unknown. Um, and again, keeping in mind that if normative data are unavailable, recovery can't really be known, it's only improvement. Uh, granted that you know we have point A, 
And if you're two standard deviations above the mean, uh, the pretreatment mean, then you know people will argue that you have recovered because it's so far outside of that treatment group that what other option is there, right? But um, again, this is this is a matter of some debate, and some people will say that no, you can only call it uh, improvement, and so to be conservative, I'm going to go with that. Um, but you know, if you really have some kind of unique argument and you can argue it, then certainly. Um, you know, you can do that as long as you're backing up your argument with, you know, previous literature and sound logic, um, you know, you can do that. Uh, okay, so basically you need, you need this, you need normative data to be within uh, the, the ballpark, so to speak. Um, and again, we'll do, uh, hopefully we'll have time to, to do an example of the, uh, of the uh, relative change index. Okay, so, uh, right, we can count up the number of people who fall into each one of these cells, right? So not only can we describe each individual participant, um, we can also talk about uh, what percentage of clients improve or are recovered. Um, you literally count up the number of those who deteriorated, those who were unchanged, those who improved, and those who recovered. And, um, and then you can say, how effective the treatment really is, how clinically significant the treatment is for how many people. Um, if you're doing a study that doesn't have normative data to compare, then you're just literally augmenting your descriptive statistics, right? You can say, well, the, uh, the anxiety score in my study, there was a mean of 55 and a standard deviation of seven, um, and you know, 25% were uh, uh, deteriorated, 25% were unchanged, 25% improved, and 25%, I'm sorry, that's like 125%, but <laughs> you get the idea. Um, with normative data though, this is where you can actually get uh, even more in depth with your analyses. Because if you do have normative data, then you can compare the frequencies of those who are deteriorated, unchanged, improved, or recovered, and uh, compare those data in your you know, experimental group and your control group, and you know if if the if the amount of those who recovered is significantly higher now I'm going back to statistical significance if it's statistically significantly higher in your experimental group than in the control group then that's great because you can you can literally show that that is um, uh, a statistically significant difference not just the frequencies are different but that they are so different that it's uh, uh, that they're coming from different populations, as we said. And the reason they're coming from different populations would be that, you know, they've gone through a different treatment. Um, and so, yeah, so with normative data, you're not only augmenting your uh, descriptive statistics as in the case of not having um, – I'm sorry, I'm just going to mute everyone because I'm getting a lot of uh, feedback. Um, with uh, uh, without normative data, you're only augmenting your descriptive statistics for the distribution uh, that uh, that you have. Um, and if you do have normative data, then you can also augment your inferential statistics, like a t-test. You know, if you're comparing group one and group two, you can say whether it's statistically significantly different. And then you can talk about the frequencies of each of these different types of uh, outcomes, and that augments those stats as well. Um, Okay, so remember that was quantitative measures, right? So now uh, I'm going to shift into qualitative measures. Let's zoom back out, look at the forest for a second. Uh, and uh, the first half was quantitative measures. This point now is shifting into qualitative measures of clinically significant change. Um, so with qualitative measures, Oh, he's only supposed to pop up one at a time. Okay, let's just focus on this first point here. Um, there's there's a critique of quantitative measures um, that says that there's only a small relationship between symptom change and client ratings of symptom change and satisfaction with treatment. So when it when I say symptom change, I mean you know scores on an inventory like the like the Beck depression scale. Uh, that, that would be a symptom here. 
So even if your symptom score, if your BDI score changes, uh, your own perception of change and your satisfaction with treatment doesn't necessarily, uh, uh, it's not necessarily consistent with that quantitative change. Um, and there's, there's lots of research to back this up. Actually, Kasdan, uh, I cite Kasdan in here somewhere. Um, what? Okay. Uh, we'll get there. Um, Kasdan does a really good review of, uh, of this critique. Um, and so, for example, um, a client could believe that he or she has greatly improved and is doing much better or functioning really well as, a, as an effect of the treatment when the symptom measure actually says otherwise. Like, oh, no, there hasn't been any quantitative improvement, but the person reports, uh, you know, a drastic improvement. Or the opposite could be true as well. Um, okay, now another critique of quantitative measures is that, is that the same degree of change in symptoms for two different clients could have different impacts on their lives. So one person, uh, let's just use a different example uh, with marital conflict. If there's a reduction in marital conflict that is, you know, the same for two couples, you know, you have some, some scale of marital conflict and they uh, both, both couples score the same for one couple. It could be enough to, uh, you know, have their quality of their relationship be reported as being greatly improved. For another, it might not be enough and they might get divorced. So, okay, you know, they had the same degree of change on the scale, but, you know, vastly different outcomes, right? Um, and then uh, there's also uh, this notion that um, quantitative approach may be inappropriate for difficult to treat conditions. If you're not expecting a massive change if 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 it's not possible to administer a quantitative instrument um you know you could have uh uh someone who is nonverbal for example somebody who uh uh is too young to tell you what the problem is somebody who has uh, a traumatic brain injury who knows what the case may be um it may not always be possible to administer a uh, scale, but it may be possible to uh, still get a sense of whether they're improving or not. And you can't do that with, you know, administering a scale. You have to do that by interacting and, uh, and getting a sense of what's, what's happening with the client. Um, right. So uh, you could also have uh, a case where it's not, you know, a, a as bad as what I just described, but you might have someone who has uh, a small change in their quantitative scale, but their quality of life um, improves to the point where uh, the self-report and the actual lived experience is much more improved, is clinically significantly improved, despite a small change in a, in a quantitative scale. It might be just enough to push someone into a comfort zone or push them out of their comfort zone and they can, for example, go to a social event. And that, you know, has a massive impact on, uh, on their overall quality of life. Even though according to the, the scale of, let's say, social anxiety, they may have only had a tiny uptick. Well, that quantitative uptick isn't very useful when uh, the person has been able to be pushed into or pushed themselves into, uh, you know, a, a new social situation and, uh, you know, maybe realize it wasn't so bad. And then, you know, you see a massive improvement. So, uh, you know, qualitative uh, measures of, um, uh, of clinically significant change are also very important to uh, keep in mind. So how do we evaluate that? Well, so with, uh, with qualitative uh, analyses, it's a, there are different criteria. Basically, you've got things like impressions, judgments, opinions uh, of either the client or those who interact with them. Um, so it's basically a self-report, right? Uh, and you see in, uh, in the therapy context, uh, this could be, um, you know, taking up a lot of a particular session, right? Um, there's also a criterion of whether an original problem that a client came in for continues to be evident uh, over time. 
and you can certainly track that and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit but you know sometimes clients come in and they have you know a specific problem um, and you know you can uh, you can track it over time uh, then there's another criterion which is the level of change is recognizable by peers and significant others you know people just sometimes know it when they see it it's like oh you know you know they're doing much better uh, or a client may report oh you know my my friend or my spouse or a family member said that they see a difference in me um, even if the client themselves doesn't see it the, there is this criterion of uh, of uh, peers and significant others and so on family members what have you uh, recognizing change and then finally there's improvement in everyday functioning so activities of daily living um, basically uh, you know getting by if you will uh, especially with um, uh, diagnoses like depression you know you have uh, uh, things like um, a lack of activity uh, a lack of motivation um, all these different things that go into not being able to to function in terms of uh, just activities of daily living um, so Kasdan, like I said, yeah, Kasdan from 2001 uh, did a review of some of these issues. Uh, and so, you know, it's a great read. He's actually very funny. He uses an example of, uh, of his family at Thanksgiving dinner to, uh, uh, to argue that, you know, everybody has problems. Um, very, uh, very fun read. Um, okay, so uh, when we look at how to uh, go about this, because it's a little bit subjective. Right? How do you talk about impressions, judgments, and opinions, or whether problems continue to be evident? Well, a lot of the time, the type of problem dictates the goals that you set in therapy, and um, the client and the therapist establish goals together, and with uh, uh, different types of approaches, um, these goals can be more or less uh, concrete. Um, you know, it could be, okay, I'm going to go to, uh, you know, one social event per month or per week or what have you, and then see if that goal has been met, right? Um, but you can be systematic about it. And uh, it is relatively subjective, but that's the nature of the beast. And certainly um, with some problems, uh, these things are, are a bit more murky than others. But in any case, uh, goal setting is part of the process. And if you're doing research, then certainly you would want to um, uh, uh, annotate the, uh, uh, the sessions and um, have some transcript of, of how the client is doing in terms of establishing and, and meeting goals and how that changes over time. And you can actually quantify that. But again, that's a, a story for another time. So uh, semi-structured interviews are another way uh, that you can you can track uh, progress and um, they can be also used for research. So you can establish these kinds of central questions to discuss. It's similar to establishing goals, um, but it's really uh, more about um, the the research interest per se. So if if there's a treatment that is experimental and you want to know whether it's working then as a researcher, uh, you can have specific questions that you want to get at to see whether or not certain aspects of functioning um, are being, are changing over time. So uh, in terms of this, you know, you would code uh, the client's utterances, how they respond to these central questions. You would generate themes um, and then uh, track changes in themes over time so you can sh you can track how much of a certain kind of theme uh the the client uh talks about and also whether or not how they talk about that theme changes over time and then um, you can certainly uh, summarize that in a paper in a dissertation so on and so forth um, now when uh, uh when we go into uh, these kinds of methods, um, I'm going to do a, a shameless plug for Dr. Adu's services because he's much more expert in uh, qualitative methods. So this is, uh, you know, just a general overview, and I'm not going to go into more depth than this. 
Um, but certainly, if you have questions about these kinds of issues, uh, he would be available to uh, assist you. Okay, so to summarize, um, we looked at statistical significance. Does a group change over time? Does a group uh, uh, change in terms of resembling a normative group over uh, after treatment versus before treatment? Um, do they improve compared to themselves before treatment? Uh, and then we looked at effect sizes that are a corollary to statistical significance testing. It tells you not just was there a change, but how big was the change? And then we looked at clinical significance, right? Um, for each individual within that group, how much are they changing? Can we say that they are now closer to, uh, you know, a normative level of functioning? Um, and if so, by how much, right? We've got improvement, we've got recovery, um, different levels of, of clinically significant change. Uh, and we also looked at the qualitative measures of clinical significant, clinically significant change. Um, you know, are people uh, experiencing change, regardless of whether there's some kind of quantitative measurement that you could administer to them? Um, and if so, how do they describe it? What is the nature of that change? Um, and can you, uh, you know, say that it is clinically significant? Um, okay, so again, the, the takeaway is that the individual level of analysis is central to clinically significant uh, change, and you don't want to lose the trees for the forest, right? Again, there's, uh, there's going to be um, times at which it's good to talk about the group. Um, there's going to be times when it's good to talk about the individual, and um, depending on the type of research you're doing, one should take primary focus over the other. And with therapy research, um, it's definitely true that the individual level should be uh, given at least some priority, um, if not most of the priority, actually. OK, so uh, we've only got about a minute. Um, I, I do have to go, but um, there is a, uh, a slide here where you can get those uh, reliable change index scores. So um, basically, there's this value of the RCI, and you see down here at the bottom, any RCI greater than 1.96 would be unlikely to occur by chance alone, meaning that it's very likely that there was a clinically significant change. So if your RCI is greater than 1.96, then that participant for who you get these data for um, can be said to have um, recovery. Now, there's all these different values that go into it, right? There's the post-treatment score, there's the pre-treatment score, and then there's the denominator. This is very similar to calculating an effect size, which we did earlier for Cohen's D. Um, and this is just, a, you know, the, the denominator is a little bit complex, but basically um, you've got uh, all the different pieces of information here. So if you, uh, you know, if you do a screen grab or if you go on YouTube later or if, uh, you know, you email me and I send you the PDF, you'll have all of these numbers that you can plug in. And um, you basically start at the bottom and you get this piece first, the S, the, the uh, standard deviation times the square root of one minus the internal consistency. You plug that into this equation here. Uh, you crunch this number and then you get your um, uh, S diff that goes into the denominator here. Um, that's It's the standard error of the difference is what that stands for. Uh, but anyway, so you plug all those numbers in and then you get your value and you look at whether it's more or less than 1.96 and that's it. Um, anyway, I'm happy to talk about this more offline. Um, you can email me uh, or call me. I'll give you my contact info in a minute. Here are the references uh, for this presentation. Again, you can track these down through the library. Um, we have full text of all of them, I believe. And if not, then Google Scholar does have the full text. So have at it. And right, here's that contact info. Um, 